pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, before I begin, I just wanted to thank the Association of the U.S. Army for this opportunity. Uh, we've had a tremendous time with this project, and we're very excited to present these results. Uh, we're very encouraged. We would describe them as breakthrough, but we will let you be the judges, of course. Uh, and also before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge two key ACON dignitaries uh, who were able to join us today. Uh, first is ACON's uh, Board of Directors member, Global Security and Intelligence Advisor, uh, Don Hepburn. Uh, Don has spent uh, nearly three decades in the service of this country, first at the CIA, at the Director of Opera uh, De Directorate of Operations, uh, finishing his government service with the FBI as the Deputy Assistant Director of International Operations. Uh, so thank you very much, Don. Uh, also joining us from Lockheed Martin Missile and Fire Control uh, Division is Dr. Clara Rivero uh, Belain. Uh, Dr. Clara was integral in the success of this project. Uh, without Dr. Clara, we would not be able to show the laser survivability aspect. Uh, so we're deeply indebted and look forward to presenting that data to you. So a brief intro about Akon Semiconductor, um, to those who may not be aware, uh, we're the global leader in diamond semiconductor technology. Um, this means we specialize in lab-grown electronics-grade diamond for both applications in semiconductor optics as well as semiconductor electronics. Uh, our work has been highly recognized uh, both from the technical community as well as prominent media. Uh, we've won things like the R&D 100, Forbes 30 Under 30, uh, Bloom, uh, Bloomberg's Year Ahead, as well as being featured in prestigious outlets like Scientific American, uh, CNET, uh, Bloomberg, uh, and others. Uh, our facility is actually located in northern Illinois. Uh, we do all of our manufacturing domestically. And our hero product is actually our Mirage Diamond Glass, shown here. Um, this brings the strength and hardness of diamond to your glass display structures, and it's the same expertise that we've been leveraging uh, for military uh, service and application. So the problem I want to speak to is one I think we're all aware of in this room, particularly you warfighters. Uh, it's us as a company has faced this uh, same problem in terms of developing the technology, and the American people, I think, have also seen this problem daily. And of course, the problem I speak to is that of near-peer adversaries. So as we understand, uh, the threat of laser or directed energy weapons is not some far off and away future problem. This is something that is here today. It's a clear and present danger that will only be continued in terms of its use against us. Uh, EM, electromagnetic limiting, has also been identified as an immediate priority. Um, so these are two major focal points. Uh, and while we speak to the priority of modernization and future vertical lift, I think it's readily understood that this has cross-applicability and is not just something that faces only the Army, but rather more broadly all of our military and defense. 
And we also understand that our adversaries not only are seeking out diamond technology, but are also researching and incorporating this technology in their advanced weapons programs. So from a commercial perspective, we understand that there is some loss or some potential risk to revenue, but it's actually a much more grave concern. Because arriving second means mission failure. This means a target not hitting its ultimate uh, desired uh, uh, location. Or in, even worse, it means downcraft or the loss of per, uh, potential loss of personnel. So with this, we uh, proposed uh, six months ago uh, our Mirage Diamond Protective Coatings. Now, diamond is somewhat known to be an extreme material. It has the highest thermal conductance, the highest hardness, some other extreme properties which make it very favorable for electronics application. Uh, but perhaps a lesser known material, a two-dimensional material, fluorinated graphene oxide, also has these extreme properties. Very high Vickers hardness, very high thermal conductance, very high thermal shock resistance. The combined system of which promises to offer uh, all of the necessities needed to, protective, uh, to protectively coat uh, these directed energy uh, facing systems. So we collaborated, as I mentioned, with Lockheed Martin Missile and Fire Control Division to optimize these properties to demonstrate survivability against a one micron laser, um, this being uh, one type of laser system that is commonly used uh, in field. Uh, from the EM portion, I know this is not something that we had originally uh, planned on presenting, but due to the success of the laser demonstration, we decided to also present the EM facing aspects to show the potential of this, uh, this particular uh, system. Some challenges that we had to overcome, fluorinated graphene oxide is obviously very difficult to fabricate, it being a new material, uh, particularly in optics. Uh, the current method of producing it, though, is very expensive. It takes a long time to chemically exfoliate um, this material, over 48 hours inside of a chamber, um, actually to, to reduce it. And this has never been demonstrated on diamond before. Um, that uh, relating to the FGO side, we still have the problem of optimizing the diamond, uh, particularly for this laser energy. So that is exactly what we set out to do. And thankfully, we had a video and camera with us during the video, uh, fabrication part of this. And I'm happy to present that to you now. So as soon as we saw this uh, last image, we were very encouraged. As I mentioned, FGO is very, very difficult to synthesize. Um, but as soon as we saw the water droplet move from a hydrophilic material um, to a super hydrophobic material, we knew we were about to see something very exciting. Uh, what we see here is the atomic force microscope image of the graphene oxide. You can see the clear ribboning, um, which is associated with the graphene oxide. You can't see the surface below. This is before the material has been reduced. After it's been reduced, you can clearly see the diamond grains. You can clearly see the graphene oxide. And you can clearly see this two-dimensional sheet of FGO. This two-dimensional sheet is the same thing that causes it to be um, highly hydrophobic. So the water is actually uh, repelled from the surface. Neat feature in consumer necessary in military, because this also means it's resistant to oxidation, which means it's appropriate for uh, altitude flight as well as uh, potentially corrosive environments. 
So this is the world's first demonstration of FGO on diamond. We have submitted this breakthrough work to several uh, reporting outlets within the academia, uh, both in physics and quantum chemistry. Um, two things I wanted to point out, let's understand this is very technical data, but um, this part is readily discernible. Uh, the atomic force uh, microscope image, both of the diamond on uh, silicon as well as the diamond on fused silica. This is showing the material on both a crystalline structure and an amorphous structure. So it can be appreciated. We can put this on uh, glass. We can put this on opaque surfaces, we can put this on metal. Much of the uh, craft is existingly addressable by this part of the demonstration alone without any tunability thus far. Raman, uh, Raman spectroscopy, is highly sensitive to crystalline analysis and is particularly useful in terms of carbon material. As you can see before the conversion, we see the diamond signature point and we see the graphene oxide points both at the diamond D-band and the G-band. After the conversion, we see that that D-band and G-band is still there. We see some things here in the middle. What we're seeing in the middle is actually the sensitivity of all of the carbon inlets and outlets being picked up. So we actually see that this is a highly fluorinated graphene oxide sample. And so with this uh, success, we are very excited to test this new supermaterial in terms of its capability and field. So the first we did was a normal EM shielding test. This was done at Spartan in uh, Spartan Lab in uh, Silicon Valley. Inside of a Faraday cage room, we actually had this uh, EM shielding test. Uh, we were told uh, by EM experts that between two and eight gigahertz uh, would be an extreme band of interest. And in doing so, we set up an RF signal generator as well as an amplifier transmitting through this copper, uh, transmitting through this styrofoam block through a smaller aperture where the only way to exit this uh, would be for the attenuated signal to pass through the sample under test. It is then picked up by an analyzer, and then we're able to understand and uh, to characterize uh, the absorption. And we saw some pretty outstanding EM limiting performance from these parts, uh, particularly between five, uh, between 5 and 8 gigahertz. We saw on the low end about 5.3 dB isolation or absorption, all the way up to about 15 dB uh, absorption. To characterize that, that means that incoming noise um, will be reduced at 15 dB down to 3%. So roughly 97% of that signal noise that's being targeted towards the craft will be absorbed by this material. So highly, highly conducive um, from the EM shielding aspects. From the laser standpoint, again, we sent these samples to Lockheed Martin Missile and Fire Control Systems, and uh, Dr. Clara back there uh, is available to answer any of the questions on the test. Um, but I did not change or alter any of the wording on the next two slides from Lockheed. I want you to know, aside from bolding some uh, key points, this is their wording and uh, their imaging. So we set up this uh, laser survivability test uh, under a uh, one micron laser um, using an NDEAG laser source. Um, this was first uh, attenuated and uh, set to a sample reference point for the uncoated fused silica. And then we were able to ramp under uh, set time and set power to see how the damage was affecting the other samples. And as you can see, we'll go layer by layer here and actually show the damage per depth. Something interesting happens. Um, first, in the few silica sample, we see there's catastrophic failure. Catastrophic failure means that the material is ablated. These uh, cracks continue to propagate through the surface structure, and that's a failure. This means the laser has punched through the system. In the diamond-coated fused silica and the FGO-protected sample, we see something else. We see that the damage is actually different in that it doesn't ablate or crack the material. Rather, the energy is absorbed, and we see a crystalline change, where it actually reverts from diamond into graphite, so it still continues to dissipate this heat that's coming through without actually failing. And this test was done, again, normalizing the function of the power to the uh, silicon, uh, uncoated fused silica reference sample. And again, we see that the damage for both the Mirage Diamond and the Mirage Diamond uh, FGO coded sample was a full order of magnitude less than the fused silica reference. And most importantly, even at the highest laser power available, no catastrophic damage of the Mirage Diamond coded fused silica sample or the FGO was observed. So we see that this material survives and uh, proving the thesis that it is a durable construct against uh, directed energy or laser weaponry. This can be tuned, I want to mention, to favor different uh, wavelengths, so we can go to different uh, laser modules. So if we want to move to point 0.8 or up, that's highly tunable. Same thing from the electromagnetic side, it's also highly tunable. 
So in summary, I just want to state again, we were successful in fabricating these nanodiamond and FGO on nanodiamond protective coatings in batch quantity. We did this using a low cost, large area system. And again, using chemical dispersion or spin dispersion for the graphene oxide, it's a very cheap and highly scalable uh, way to do such. Again, we reduced the total production time for just 48 hours to the FGO down for the entire production of this part to less than eight hours per batch. So as it stands today, highly, highly manufacturable. From the survivability demonstration, we showed that over 10 times less damage in these parts with no catastrophic failure, even at the highest laser power, with the ability to tune the EM uh, to favor a particular band. Again, the advanced materials uh, research has been advanced. We've submitted these papers. We've created new patents. And we've really opened the door to optimize this in future work. Um, the total composite thickness for the system is less than one micron. I don't want to go into specific dimensions because there is some sen sensitivity around the structure. But we can easily thicken out the structure to uh, handle even more laser damage, if so desired. And last, I just want to thank you again for your attention. I want to point out two individuals who are not able to join us uh, today in the room, but were highly impactful in the run-up to this project. First, General Petraeus and uh, Vice Admiral Charles uh, Moore, Jr., both consulted in this project. And I got to tell you, um, <laughs> speaking to two individuals have led command and to say what we want to do to actually move the needle on this technology and to not have them laugh at you, first, is the great, <laughs> great thing. But second, to say go ahead and run at it and to be highly encouraging was you know, exactly what we needed to hear in this project and certainly bolstered our efforts. So I want to thank you again for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. What's the largest substrate that you can currently coat? Uh, in our current system, it's a 12 inch by 12 inch. Um, we're planning to scale up this equipment size to go over one meter by one meter. So we're not currently constrained by any size um, in terms of the surface area. In terms of the thickness, we want to optimize the thinness of the material uh, so it's lower cost and these very thin film structures. Additionally, because we're in the nano regime, we're talking about roughly one ten thousandth thickness of a human hair. So there's no weight modification by integrating such a system. And what is the relationship between the thickness of the various, the FGO and diamond layers and the, um, um, the protective and absorp absorptive properties, both in the um, sort of near IR and in the, then in the, the mm -hmm. So we actually have a multi-layer uh, intellectual property, so we're able to tune the transmissivity of the through material without significantly impacting the hardness, so that's on the diamond side. Uh, on the FGO side, we want to keep this less than 10 nanometers. We want to keep this atomically thin. The reason being, then, is you have a highly uniform single sheet without any serious effect to the optics. Uh, the optic power, uh, clear, I believe it was 6.5 kilowatts. The laser power source, I believe it was a 6.5 kilowatt laser. Oh, two kilowatt laser. Thank you. And is there a relationship to the that optic power? Um, did you, uh, how did you determine you, that was the maximum power you wanted to go to? Is there any? That was the maximum power that? of that system. Okay. Yes. And certainly, in future works, we'll be using a, a higher uh, energy <coughs> system. Uh, two qu two questions. Yes. Time of the laser left on the sample. Mm -hmm. You said it it just dispersed the heat. So how long are we leaving that laser on the sample where it's not damaging it? So in this particular sample, they left it until uh, damage uh, was onset, which I believe occurred roughly at the 60 second mark. Um, the total time duration that was 70 seconds for each sample in this particular test. Okay, and then. 12 by 12 inches, looking at one meter to one meter, um, how much longer than the eight hours will it take to create a, a piece much larger than the 12 by 12? So there's two ways to look at this. Um, one, if we're doing like a mosaic tile or a specific componentry, certainly within one production shift, we can have many of these parts done. So there's a large volume, um, a large a volume process. If we wanted to do very large area, that would mean we would have to be doing this one at a time. But we can certainly scale the area. Um, depending on the thickness, again, we're dealing with less than one micron. So we're dealing uh, at that thickness, you know, less than eight hours processing total time. From the diamond, uh, from the diamond side, less than four hours. And that's one sample per eight hours? In the uh, smaller size, when we're doing many components today, it's roughly 16 samples per batch. So 16 per that eight hour, or one large. 
You said it was optically transparent? Correct, within the visible spectrum. And tunable to filter certain wavelengths? Yeah, so uh, diamond is known to be absorptive within the infrared region traditionally. We've developed IP to optimize this uh, transmissivity. So we marry this with uh, another film of higher or lower refractive index to optimize the transmissivity, lower the reflectance down to zero at the surface. So there's ways, to, even though diamond has traditionally been barred from such applications, there are ways um, to engineer the material. I was thinking about goggles for, mm. you know, People spend a lot of money on sunglasses. Oh, yes. And if you had the right coating, your sunglasses might be able to protect you against other things. Certainly, and yeah, we actually uh, can do uh, semi-curved or two and a half dimensional coating, so it does not have to be uh, flat. So for curved and lens type, we've already demonstrated that. And we've worked with companies like Luxottica, um, the world leader in uh, sunglasses or eyeglass um, for their interest. So certainly the demand is there on the commercial side and technologically it's something we've already demonstrated. So if you were to transition your processes to some more um not fusilica or silica, into a more conformal material, um, what are the challenges associated with that? Uh, I guess the only challenge would be with direct integration on materials like copper. Um, there's some adhesion issues between diamond and copper um, that are traditionally known. Um, there are workarounds, but some development work would need to be done. Uh, otherwise, uh, most metals, uh, most refractory metals have already been demonstrated with diamond, titanium, aluminum, uh, tungsten, all known metals, um, easily demonstrable. So you had mentioned about the uh, super hydrophobic you know, aspect. What was the contact angle? Uh, in the smallest, uh, 105, and at the max, 154. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a graph you showed. Um, it kind of showed the two peak angles with the encoded fusilica versus the substrates. I think it was about three or four. It was uh, a black and a red. You had a um, wavelength on one axis, and I think it was intensity on the other. Yes, this yeah, one. Yeah, could you speak a little bit more to what, what is the delta between? Oh, the sure. Delta? So this is just a, a arbitrary intensity difference between the two. So the intensity is uh, mapped in arbitrary units. The main thing to take away from these two is that first, you'll notice there are two spectra. Uh, for each sample, we measured it at two different points. Um, so we want to show consistency across the specimen of material. The second is that you see that the intensity, you see it's a sharp peak at the diamond band, uh, the D band, so we see that there's a strong diamond crystallinity. And we also see a fairly broad peak at the GO, so we know that this comes from both the grain boundaries as well as the graphene oxide. Post-process, we see this peak is still very sharp. It's not broad at these points, but we also see sharp points at every inlet and outlet of the carbon in between these points. So this means we have a highly uniform sheet, which we can see here. Um, this is the FGO stitch. You can see very clearly. You can see through the material. Uh, this is two-dimensional. We see the diamond grains uh, on each side. And then we also see the characteristic white wrinkle. So um, this is basically showing from a crystalline spectra what um, the crystalline sample seems to, appear, uh, seems to be performing like. And we see here visually, we can see all of these things characterized and visible. If there are any other questions, thank you very much. <laughs>